my name is Chris Jackson. I'm a sales engineer, at Snow, currently a, Snow, a sales engineer at Snowflake. Um, so this is my topic for the day. Um, my plan for the next 18 minutes, I think I'm allowed, first to talk briefly about cloud. What is it that cloud might bring to data and analytics? Um, secondly, perhaps ask the question, data warehousing, is that still relevant anyway? Why, why do we, what do we mean by a data warehouse? Then I'm going to bring those two together and actually ask, well, what might we want out of a cloud data warehouse? What sort of features might it have to deliver some of these theoretical benefits? And then finally, if I have a bit of time, I might talk a little bit about um, the way Snowflake chose to architect its new database to, to try and achieve some of those benefits. Um, but before I get started, I mean, who have we got in the room? Have we got data engineers, data data architects, um, BI people, yep, quite a few of you, good, uh, cloud architects, some cloud people in the room, business people, great, people who actually have to pay the money for all of this stuff, yep, some of you as well, cool. Okay, so if I was standing here three years ago, I would be talking Hadoop, okay? And in fact, every company had to have a Hadoop strategy. Every CIO had to announce what his Hadoop strategy was, even though half those CIOs had no idea why they were doing Hadoop. And that's probably why so many Hadoop projects failed. So what we see now is, is it just the same thing? Is, is cloud just this year's buzzword, and in three years, Gartner will be announcing us also as obsolete? There's a challenge, and yet, we know we still have a problem. This is from Forrester from last year. We, we like working with those guys. Three quarters of us, I'm surprised it's only three quarters, want to be data driven. But actually, less than 30% would say they're managing to turn that data into real action. Now, there's two problems, really, I think. One is a business problem, okay? One is you actually need a business strategy for what you want to do with your data. How is the data going to improve things for your business? Are you, are you going to monetize it? Is it going to provide better customer satisfaction? Is it going to shorten your logistics chain? So, without a business strategy, all the great technology is, is nothing. You know, buy Hadoop or even buy Snowflake is not a business strategy, okay? But as data technologists, and I consider myself one of those, we also have to admit that we can be an enabler, but also a blocker. We still are causing problems. We've been talking about data silos for 20, 30 years, and to be honest, we still have them. In, in some ways, over the last three or four years, I've actually seen that problem get worse as people invent more and more silos to put their data in. Cost, if the business comes to us and says, I've got this great new idea, we say, yeah, that's great. Could I have 10 million kroner and um, I'll build you a system? And the business, you know, they may not know if that idea is going to work. They want to try it out. We want to make the data more demo uh, democratic. But that means now we have the data scientist running the query from hell, the reporting users, the chief exec who expects his dashboard very, very quickly. Oh, and by the way, did the data engineers tell you they're doing continuous streaming ETL 24 by 7? And all of these come together, and typically they start colliding and clashing. You, you have to decide who gets the data. We have one customer who literally, they were deciding who gets the database on a Monday morning. Okay, I'm seeing some smiles here. You're familiar with this. So inflexibility, when, when, when the business comes to us with their great new idea, we say, this is great, and maybe in six weeks' time, we give you a platform to try that idea out on. Or we say, well, that's great, but you, you've insisted on bringing in this Twitter data, and that's in this thing called JSON, and mm, we're going to have to do some clever engineering to transform it for you. And out of a lot of what's been going in the last few years, I think we've actually added complexity. Yeah, which is great if you're a data engineer and you make your living out of complexity, but for the rest of us, you know, that, that doesn't really help. And I'd argue that the business has some, or the modern data-driven business has some specific things it's looking for out of what we're delivering here. And I'd also say, 
the cloud actually has the ability to meet some of that, some of that vision. So um, just take a couple of examples. This scaling, you know, I've never seen an analytic platform which runs like this. Analytic platforms have a horrible habit of being very busy at times and disappointing the users and very quiet at others. In other words, expensive iron sitting there doing nothing. The cloud in principle, if you, if you don't just treat the cloud as another data center in which to just move your, your IT, but actually start looking at what the cloud should offer, it should be giving you resources when you need them and taking them back when you don't. Similarly, just pick a, another slightly more esoteric one, partner e ecosystem. Okay, there are different companies working together in the cloud, and wh why shouldn't they be sharing data in the same way that they share application interfaces? Okay, so I, I've sort of tried to make my argument that the cloud might have something new and slightly different to offer. But what about this question? You know, Come on, Chris. I know you were there. You're, you're old. You were there in the 1990s building these data warehouses. But you know, haven't we moved on past the central data warehouse? Beautifully third normal form. Took forever to build. In fact, to be honest, we never quite finished it. So even back in the 1990s, we had this raging debate. You know, should you focus on the data warehouse or the data marts that actually gave? the business, the data in the format they wanted, dimensional modeling. Some of you were there. You remember the, you know, the religious wars between them. So we, we have this thing about you know, delivering the data in the way the users actually want to see it. And then over the last um, few years, the, the idea of perhaps we always had the idea of a staging area where you put raw data, um, but that's been extended to the data lake. Okay? We've suddenly had, particularly from the internet, floods of data coming in. And we don't know its value, really, so we need to store it quite cheaply. It has this horrible habit of being in formats that don't sit neatly in our data warehouse anyway. So the data lake has grown there as a concept. And maybe even in the middle, in the data warehouse, you know, new um, paradigms have come, like data vault. I don't know if there's data vault enthusiasts here. People saying, well, actually, third normal form isn't really what you want. What you want is data vault. Now, Actually, I'm a big fan of this. I'm a, I'm a data architect by background. I've spent a lot of my career building large data-driven projects. So I think this stuff's fantastic. Logically, some of the thinking here is brilliant. This idea of bringing in the data and as it establishes its value, sort of feeding it through the value chain. And at the same time, maybe allowing certain types of users to dip into all these pools. The, the, the challenge you've had is that you've had a lot of sort of technology size, right? And you've had technologies that are very good at, say, at one thing, at data marts, or maybe a technology that's really suited for data lakes. And that means you start building new technology silos of, of products that are good for one thing, OK? I have an even bigger problem when the vendor of any of these pieces comes along and says you don't need the other bits in your logical architecture, because actually you only need the bit that we, as a vendor, happen to be capable of doing. OK, with me so far. Cool. Right, so um, just wouldn't it be nice? We'll come back to this. Just a thought. Let's say you're with me so far. You accept that maybe the cloud has something to offer, except that with my broadened definition of um, the logical data warehouse, maybe the data warehouse is still relevant for the 21st century. What happens if we bring these together? What, what sort of things do we want this thing to do? Well, I'd argue first, we want a proper SQL database, not some sort of SQL-like layer that sits on top of something else. Yeah? And by that, I mean all the things that you would expect a SQL database to deliver. I mean things like the sort of analytic functions, the windowing functions, and so on, that have come out of um, various analytic requirements over the last 10, 15 years. And also, you've got an investment in many cases in existing BI and ETL tools. So it'd be really nice if you didn't have to throw all of that away. But we, we, we have to address this challenge that comes from the data lake. What is it that we need to be able to do um, in order to meet some of those data lake requirements? One is semi-structured data. It's not going away. Um, we need to be able to bring that semi-structured data in. We need to give it the same tender, loving care that we give to relational data, the same sort of performance. We need to be able to join it. 
but without sort of telling people that before they're allowed to use it, they have to sort of unpick it into 20 different tables. You know, it comes in in a hierarchy, let's leave it in a hierarchy. There's a whole new set of processing paradigms that have come out of the, I suppose, the data lake movement. Um, uh, you know, and, 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 and these are going to continue, Kafka, Spark, and so on. So there are data engineers now used to dealing with these tools, so we want to be able to work with them. And this is the one that, frankly, often appealed to the CIO. We've got to offer massive amounts of really cheap storage, right? It's, 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 it can't be expensive to store the data. In the cloud, we should be offering unlimited scale. The cloud offers unlimited scalability for practical purposes, OK? So we should be offering the same. We should be offering the ability to apply processing power as and when it's needed, and just as importantly, not apply it when it's not needed. We should allow all these different groups of users to come together and all access the data somehow without stopping each other from working. And to be honest, there's, there's enough thinking that's gone on in the sort of data and analytic engine space over the last few years. You know, we shouldn't be asking people to spend their lives tuning and indexing and partitioning and distributing their data and so on. There are techniques to avoid that. And finally, and perhaps this is perhaps a snowflake point of view, you know, it's a bit like Salesforce. You, you, you don't sort of expect to have to do all the Salesforce setup yourself. So, you, you want resilience out of the box. The cloud providers are providing brilliant resilience, okay? Um, S3 storage, Azure Blob storage, is automatically replicated across availability zones. It's easy to get solutions to actually be highly resilient in the cloud. Secondly, no one's going to trust you with your data unless it's secure, so it better be encrypted everywhere, right? Just, just take that as a given, all your data encrypted, um, all the traffic encrypted, and so on. And this final promise of the cloud, pay as you go. You should only pay for what you use. You should not be paying for a platform 24 by 7 that you're not using 24 by 7. OK. Maybe some questions later. So just moving on then. Um, this, in fact, was the vision that our three, I often call them propeller head, three very techie founders um, started off with five years ago when they started um, looking at the, the way they would architect um, our particular product. And these were some of the things, all of the data, all types of data, all sizes of data, all of the users, different groups and so on. So I'll just share with you briefly the, the, the way Snowflake chose to go about architecting it. I mean, there are other solutions out there. So I, in some ways, you know, let's have a debate. Let's have a discussion. Was this the best way to go? Um, starting with the storage layer, um, key decision, put it on S3. They started off in Amazon. Put it on S3. S3 is cheap, and it's highly resilient. Okay? And in fact, under the covers, it's still database blocks. It's not raw data in S3. It's still database blocks. Um, micro partitions, they call them, lots of rows arranged in a column in a way. So it's also heavily compressed, five to one compression, let's say. So what that means is you've now got cheap storage with five to one compression. So, so, so that's, that's, you know, that, that's quite good. Um, if you're going to offer it as a service, you basically need a services layer sitting there all the time. And the users, they think they're doing ODBC, JDBC, they're talking to something that looks like a database. But in order to provide that, um, you need to provide quite a number of services. You need to allow people in. You need to have role-based security. Um, in the case of Snowflake, the way we actually achieve this dynamic scaling that I'll come on to in a minute is we manage the infrastructure. So again, that's a key decision. We look after all the servers. We, in a sense, hire them from Amazon or Azure, and then uh, the, the, the people who need those, that, that compute just ask us for it and so that we can then deliver it in, in, in seconds to them. Optimization in the metadata manager. So again, if you're going to run with S3 blocks, you've got to have a pretty good idea in order to get performance what's in which block. So you have to have a pretty intimate understanding of what's in, 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 the, in the data. 
And then we have the idea of compute. So we apply some compute to this problem. If you want to run a query, if you want to actually load data, if you just want to do DDL, data control language, that can all happen in the service layer. But once you start doing something, you need to apply some compute power to it. And it's just a, we, we call this the virtual warehouse. Um, but the important thing is you need to be able to turn that up and down like that without stopping the users, um, without kicking them off the system. Just turn it up, and if you like, when you're done, or perhaps when you've got a lower workload again, turn it down again. This was another key architectural decision. Um, and again, it's <laughs> see what you make of it. What they decided was to cope with mixed workloads rather than just have one sort of massively parallel set of compute running on the problem, you'd have multiple. So effectively, each area, each type of use case has its own warehouse. So the ETL is coming in through one. The data scientist with his query from hell is running across the other. The um, reporting users are running on another and so on. But in order to make that work, you've got to somehow work out how to make them all see a transactionally consistent view of the underlying data. The other thing you can do, potentially, um, as well as going up and down, is you can say, well, for this type of usage, let's monitor what users are using. Let's scale out and in as, as necessary. To, so when we go from 20 users to 200, we'll, we'll, we'll scale. You know, we'll, we'll actually scale with the usage. But more importantly, as the usage drops back down from 200 to 20, do that. OK, so effectively, we've split the that across to that. And it ends up looking something like this, with different sizes of warehouse for different types of use case. And then we load things like JSON and, and Parquet and so on. Uh, again, key architectural decision to be able to load them and sort of hold them internally in a column away that sort of gave good performance, but still allows the richness of that structure. And of course, continue to allow both the old paradigm and the new paradigm of connectors to come in. So actually, we, we do actually see this going on. Um, remember, I said I'm a big fan of the logical architecture. This is not about forcing everyone back into the traditional warehouse. This is about possibly having a platform that you can try some of these different things and keep them inside a particular technology. And I suppose the question is, is it working for us? We're a new company. Yeah? We, we, we didn't exist six years ago. Okay? We started in Europe a year ago. Is it working? Well. So far, it seems to be. Um, but we're a long way from perfect, um, I'm sure. The customers we work with, we work with intensively for new ideas, um, new demands, new features, improvements. Um, so we have a software release about once a week. We actually roll out a new, and I would say one with real features every, um, yeah, every couple of weeks. And I'm not allowed to tell you about any of this because this is, this, is, this is not a sales session, but do come and see me later on the um, thing. But I'll stop now and um, leave ooh, at least a minute and a half for questions. Thank you. Oh, that's better than most speakers.